Okay, so um, I've been teaching immigration law and policy for many years, uh, and after two decades, uh, I've realized that I've studied the wrong thing, uh, that I, <laughs> I should be studying what I'm talking about uh, today, uh, about these two major revolutions uh, that are ongoing, that um, you're living through right now. Uh, this, uh, to bring some context, uh, this is a map of the Silk Road, right? So if you're a Chinese merchant uh, and you start in Guangzhou province, uh, it's going to take several months. Oh, look. Petra. Yeah, in order to get to Petra, it's going to take several months uh, over land, yeah, uh, over this Eurasian continent. Uh, if you want to sail, it's going to take uh, a little shorter, but you can die. Uh, the, uh, even, if you, even if you go over land, uh, you can die as well. There are all kinds of wild animals. Uh, it takes forever. Sometimes people camp out. It takes sometimes, uh, it takes a, a, over a year, two years to get across. Yeah. Uh, just in 100 years, uh, that has profoundly changed. Between 1400 uh, and 1500, and then exponentially thereafter, uh, what we see uh, throughout the world is a massive revolution in transportation. Yeah, the sheer number of people uh, who are taken from one place to another aboard vessels that uh, can sail quite reliably, you know, so the, the big change in technology is that uh, using instruments uh, to help you... Is, am I... Should I quit moving? <laughs> <coughs> Yeah, it's all about movement, right? And I can't get, uh, I'll, I'll try to stand still. Uh, in, in that 200-year time, because navigation has improved, because overland routes are better, hundreds of thousands and then millions of people uh, are transported throughout the world. Yeah, and many, many more people uh, are born as sons and daughters of people who, are, uh, who were taken from very, very distant places. Yeah. Uh, the transportation revolution brings Europeans to the New World. Uh, by 1500, they know it's there. Uh, by 1600, they're coming at a clip. By 1700, it's a veritable flood. Yeah. Uh, aboard European, European vessels as well, millions of black people here. This is a map of the slave trade. Uh, uh, are transported from Africa uh, to the Americas uh, and eventually to the United States. And if you count everybody, uh, the conservative estimates are anywhere between 10 and 14 million people. Yeah. Uh, using 18th, 19th century technology. Yeah. Uh, the essence of this issue or this, this problem is that the transportation revolution is quite wonderful. It allows Europeans to solve some of their social problems by sending them to Virginia or to <laughs> Australia or, or uh, you know, further away, right? So in London, uh, if you are in trouble uh, in 1650 uh, and you get arrested, yeah, your choices are London prison or Virginia. Yeah. Uh, and then going to Virginia is, is not only possible, you are, there's less likelihood that you'll die. Uh, you'll probably get there. Yeah. And over time, uh, if you're white, you can acquire property. Yeah. Uh, however, the downside of that is if you're black, you are property. Yeah. Uh, you are treated as a commodity uh, and brought these vast distances uh, to places where your descendants in perpetuity uh, will be held as property. Yeah. So the thing about the two revolutions, oh, see I'm moving again. The, the thing about the two revolutions is that there are upsides and then there are downsides. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, uh, throughout, people have to make choices uh, about what kind of world uh, they will have and share in light of these massive changes. Yeah. The other revolution that occurs roughly the same time is this revolution in communication. Yeah. Uh, that's what the first printing presses look like. Uh, by the 16th and 17th century, they're in wide circulation. By the 18th century, uh, they look more like this. Yeah, uh, and they produce things like this. This is uh, early articles of confederation. Uh, these are drafts of what would eventually become uh, the American Constitution. Yeah, uh, this revolution, yeah. again, these revolutions are, are ongoing. This revolution will change the world in a different way. Yeah, uh, by producing in massive quantities uh, 
uh, political ideas that could be disseminated quickly over continents. Yeah, uh, the leaders, I mean, uh, the Americans are, uh, are amazing. Uh, the way they print uh, and the way they, on horses, send mail uh, across the colonies. Yeah, uh, by the time of the American Revolution, they have been so successfully communicating with one another using this technology that they can coordinate resistance to what is then the most powerful empire in the world, the British. Yeah, and here they are forming a, a new government uh, and calling forth a new nation yeah, that in its very core principles is just so fundamentally idealistic. Uh, you know, I mean, you have to wrap your head around this. Like prior to this moment, monarchies dominated Europe. Yeah. Uh, when the Americans uh, declare that they'll be a republic, uh, that they'll have fragmented uh, power, political power, that uh, separate branches of government would check each other, uh, that they would not have a king, yeah, and that this would be a republican form of government, that is, that's amazing, yeah. And yet at the same time, again, the downside of all this, is that the Constitution never mentions slave or slavery, yeah, but this document does legalize and envision the extension of slavery, yeah, and certainly in its several core provisions. It has weird language about how if a person is due labor in one place, the person has to be rendered in the other. Yeah, uh, that in essence is a fugitive slave rule. Right? If a slave runs away uh, to a free state, it means that the, uh, the people in the free state have to return that person back to their former owners. Yeah, uh, in some ways the slave codes uh, that were also disseminated around this time are the exact opposites of the American Constitution. Yeah, uh, that is, slaves do not have the right to bear arms. They do not get the right to speak. They don't have the right to assembly. They are not free from cruel and unusual punishment. They have no due process, yeah? Uh, all of these things that the Americans would enjoy and then conceive for themselves in this particular document, yeah, they deprived the very people that they held, yeah? Again, and then the thing about that is that those racist ideas about how black people should not vote, uh, that they should have no rights whatsoever, they become widely disseminated, yeah? Uh, and in, in fact, like around the time of the Constitution, it's not just race, but the gender dimensions of it, right? So during the time of the Constitution, there's a well, um, it's a sort of a common sense understanding among most American intellectuals that women shouldn't vote, yeah? Uh, that women should not be part of the political process, yeah? That the American president should never be a woman. There's no mention of such a thing, but it's commonly understood. And in the intellectual life that depends on publications like this, it becomes very common. Now, the thing about the race and the gendered aspect of it and the dissemination of these ideas, one could argue, and I think you can find substantial evidence for this, that we're still living with that legacy. Are we not? <laughs> if you look around the room, uh, if you look at the uh, race-based diversity in the University of California or in the state of California, you look at various patterns of incarceration and and other things, it's difficult uh, not to see at least some uh, reverberations of these kinds of ideas, yeah, and the way that they spread uh, so commonly in this age of revolution. Yeah, and in my field, you, know, uh, you can see both revolutions, transportation as well as uh, the communication revolution in something like Chinese exclusion, yeah. Uh, the Chinese, their arrival in the United States uh, is regarded as a kind of menace. Uh, this is a debate that precedes the American Civil War, uh, will accelerate after the American Civil War. And you know, the cartoon says it all, right? Uh, the Chinese are depicted as subhuman. Uh, California is envisioned as a utopian society of free white persons, yeah? Uh, in fact, uh, many leaders of California uh, insisted that it be a white man's republic. The arrival of thousands of Chinese people, yeah, is a direct threat to that, yeah? Uh, and so uh, by, again, using communication technologies, they disseminate these ideas that the Chinese are subhuman, uh, that they ought to be excluded, uh, and that they should not come. Yeah. Oftentimes in these, uh, in these depictions, you see steamships. Right? So you can see these steamships. This is a, a cartoon from about 1870. And by then, the transportation revolution is such that you don't have to rely on wind. You can put steam engines aboard vessels. Now, eventually, uh, the great irony is that the Chinese will build railroads, right, which also rely on this uh, new technology. 
Uh, on the very railroads that the Chinese helped to build, hundreds of thousands of white folks would come to California and then appeal for the exclusion of the Chinese. Right? I mean, uh, in order to uh, appreciate a, a bit of the irony, the Chinese built the very means uh, that <laughs> allowed for the migration of white folks who then uh, asked them uh, not to come. Or actually, they didn't ask. You know, they just said, yeah. It was <laughs> really wasn't that polite. I mean, oh, God, I got a quick moving. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in terms of these utopian conceptions of society, uh, it is followed uh, in, in tandem, as in the same period with the American Constitution, uh, notions of exclusion, uh, repression, and then eventually, toward the end of the Chinese period, uh, many thousands of expulsions, the Chinese would be forced to leave. Yeah. Uh, this is, in large part, uh, explains why, by 1960, Asians were less than 1% of the American population. Now, if you're in California, and if you're certain parts of California, like San Gabriel or, you know what I mean, Irvine. <laughs> yeah, you can't swing your arm without hitting someone who's Asian. But during this, <laughs> the, the, success, the success of this movement, really, I mean, it was, uh, you know, the United States did use very repressive methods to keep Asians out of the United States. And for a good 60, 70 years, uh, the Americans were very successful. And again, part of the reason for the success is the dissemination of certain kinds of ideas. That Asians are unassimilable, that Asians are subhuman, uh, that they were unfit for American citizenship, yeah? and they would never blend in uh, to the mainstream of American life. Right? So I sometimes think of that, and you'll excuse me for developing this sort of sick sense of humor uh, when it comes to race in the United States, but when I'm driving to Costco, in my minivan to buy chicken wings and beer for the playoffs, right? The whole idea that Asians are unassimilable is just kind of like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Asians are, you know, whatever. Yeah, is it? In essence, a lot of these uh, discussions that we have about race, uh, they are horrible, but they're also kind of funny uh, because they've proven so wrong, right? Uh, and you can see uh, how, in many ways, these bad ideas uh, shaped conceptions of American history, shaped American history itself. I mean, this is a very famous image of fugitive slaves. Yeah, uh, the one aspiration in the American Constitution is this idea of the rule of law, that people should be governed by settled rules, uh, that uh, uh, even the rulers themselves should be governed by law. And then the other component is law should not command the impossible. Yeah. American law uh, for many, many th decades uh, told black people that they ought to remain as property, yeah. that they should stay in place uh, and be subservient to their white masters. Yeah. Uh, did law command the impossible? Yeah. Uh, in this moment, uh, thousands as Chinese uh, people are being kicked out, yeah. uh, China is falling apart. Yeah. Uh, China is being eviscerated in the 19th century. Chinese folks are going to leave one way or another. Yeah. Uh, it actually turns out that the largest group of illegal immigrants in California in the late 19th century were Asian. Yeah. Uh, and again, did law command the impossible? Yeah. Uh, is it something that, uh, uh, that's even possible to think that when a place falls apart, the people there won't flee? Yeah, and try to come to places where they think even if they're going to be on the bottom of that society, they will still want to come. Yeah. Uh, the image on the right is a very famous painting uh, that shows American progress. And you can see the telegraph wire, again, the communication revolution, the railroads, yeah, the transportation revolution. Uh, and notice in the front, uh, the Native Americans and the wild beasts. Yeah, uh, who are fleeing before the march of white civilization. Yeah. Uh, and this kind of image, you kind of see, and this, by the way, there's very little sympathy, really, uh, for the Native Americans or for the wild animals. Everybody thought, more or less, that this is a good thing. I mean, like, if persons uh, voting in elections, right, uh, if you were a political candidate in Nebraska or in Texas, and you said, you know, wait, 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 let's not take Native American land, right? Uh, <laughs> let's not settle the frontier, yeah? Uh, what are the odds that you'd be elected? You know what I mean? Uh, the certain democratic components of American uh, expansion in the West, 
uh, dictated that when white folks are voting, and the part of the reason why is that, you know, this guy's got a farm somewhere, right? Uh, and if it's him or these guys, uh, people on the East Coast, uh, in the Midwest, were increasingly siding with these guys, yeah. Uh, and that, in large part, explains why these dynamics uh, fall out the way they do. I am now, you know, in my own research, I do research in immigration law, but mostly a lot of it uh, concerns philosophy and legal theory uh, and ethics. I think, if anything, these problems or these issues have become more severe uh, and more uh, compelling in our own time. And it's likely to dominate your life, right? Uh, the two revolutions are, you know, I mean, they're a part of uh, who we are now. Uh, if anything, they have increased uh, in pace. Yeah. Uh, if the last century was marked by the steam engine, by locomotives, by steamships, uh, this century and the one just, you know, I mean, uh, the 20th century is marked by planes. Yeah, this is what planes used to look like 100 years ago. This is what they look like now. So nice, right? That's, I pick Korean airlines, you know, because, you know, I'm Korean. Uh, that, that, <laughs> the whole idea that you can just hop on a plane, uh, be in a box, you know, that Silk Road thing where you went across Eurasia uh, and it took several months, now it's several hours, yeah? Uh, my wife uh, flies to Tokyo uh, every fifth week uh, and stays for a week and she flies, I mean, she commutes trans-Pacifically, yeah? Uh, the number of people visiting the United States uh, every year is about a quarter of the entire American population, yeah? Uh, and how many of you uh, how many of you in the room have visited another country and traversed a boundary? Yeah, see, I mean, like, yeah. Uh, in many ways, for people who are affluent, uh, people who can afford plane tickets uh, on this, yeah, I mean, in many ways, we benefit every year, uh, every month uh, from the transportation revolution. Yeah, and that's just, uh, and that's a kind of process that will continue well into your life. In fact, I wonder what it will look like in 100 years. Yeah, uh, and, if, and the idea is that given so many countries and so many places are now stitched together with transportation networks, it's very difficult to imagine any country in the world that will have a homogenous population. It's not, it's not possible, yeah. Uh, in the same way, it's impossible to imagine a world where even in the farthest corners of the world, people are not staring at technologies like this one right, uh, that offer implicitly a kind of different life than the one that they're used to, yeah, and thereby drive uh, this desire for migration, yeah, uh, and if anything, that's the life, uh, that's the kind of uh, reality that we live in now, uh, this is, this map is a, this actually shows heroin and cocaine, yeah, uh, coming from various places to, yeah, I know, <clears throat> coming from various places uh, in the Americas, mostly to the United States, yeah. But in a way, I mean, this also shows uh, pathways that are most commonly used for people who are coming illegally to the United States as well, yeah. And I propose to you that in this period, we face many of the same choices, yeah, uh, that uh, we are in this moment uh, where, in the midst of these two major revolutions, we as Americans have to make some decisions about what kind of society we want. Yeah. Uh, will we use our technology? I mean, part of the theme of this talk is about energy and power. Will we use those things uh, in a repressive direction to try to stifle uh, some of the uh, elements of, this, uh, of the transportation revolution, the communication revolutions? Uh, or will we try to do that in a different way? Yeah. Uh, and the preliminary things, are, I mean, it's not encouraging. This is what the southern border looks like. Uh, the United States has spent, uh, over the last 30 years, uh, billions of dollars building fences, right? The great irony of this is, like, lots of illegal immigrants now fly. So, <laughs> you know, you're going to need, like, a bubble or... I don't know, something bigger, yeah. Uh, this is an anachronism, uh, and yet the United States keeps building fences. Uh, the United States uh, did things that I, you know, when I was your age, most of your age, not the folks up front, but the, the, the in the back, 
uh, who are younger, when I was 20, I never thought uh, that I, in my lifetime, would see an African-American president. Yeah. Uh, and if anything, Barack Obama, who you see here, uh, is just, uh, in some ways, the way he expresses his idealism uh, about the future of the United States, it's stirring. You know, I voted for the guy twice. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, uh, he is the uh, American president who has deported more people uh, during his administration, right? Uh, if, if trends hold, he will deport anywhere between 400 and 500,000 people every year uh, by the end of his term. That is an astonishing number of people to deport, yeah? Uh, that that president is deporting that many people, yeah, uh, that's kind of a bummer, yeah. Uh, and I would ask you, I mean, really, you know, uh, my career's over in two decades. Your life is just starting. Uh, if anything, I would uh, ask you uh, to be mindful of these trends uh, and to do things that are different uh, than what previous generations of Americans have done, and in some ways embrace the reality uh, that is the two revolutions in ways that are positive rather than repressive. Thank you. <laughs>